Let's grab our Bibles. Let's go to John chapter 16. This morning we've arrived at the Lord's final instructions to his disciples as a group before he is arrested and tried and crucified. Now, in our present day, today, uh, it's now the month of February, right? Somebody confirm that I'm right. I'm not crazy. Okay, good. And we're heading towards Easter Sunday, which is just two months away now, on April the 9th. And obviously, the narrative in John's gospel is heading to the cross and to the empty tomb as well. So it's our hope and my plan, Lord willing, that, that John's gospel and Resurrection Sunday are going to sync up on the calendar And by the time we get to April 9th, guess where we're going to be? In John chapter 20. So you can pray for me in that. Lord willing, we're going to sort of sync that up and and those two things will come together uh, and it'll be really, really great. All right, they're still working on that. So I thought this would be a good morning to, to just remind ourselves about the outline of John's gospel. We haven't done this in a while. But it's always good to be to be reminded of how John's gospel progresses. And it was going to be on the screen, but I'm going to walk you through this. It's basically one, two, three, four, five, six Ps, as in Paul. The first is the prologue of John's gospel, which is the first 18 verses of John chapter 1, which is basically the big picture of who Jesus is, his deity, right? And then the second part is known as the prelude, and that's the rest of chapter 1, and that is basically the ministry of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, setting up the way for the Lamb of God to enter into the world. So we have the prologue and the prelude. Then there's this massive section that we call the public ministry of Jesus from chapter 2 through chapter 12. And that's Jesus revealing himself to Israel, right? He came to seek and save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But then when we get to chapter 13, there's a, a change. And Jesus' public ministry goes private. He begins to retreat from public view and to spend more time with his disciples to prepare them for what's to come, his leaving, right? And to get them ready for that time when he departs. So the public ministry, the private ministry runs from 13 to 17. So that's where we are right now. We're getting towards the end of that. And then, of course, comes the passion. Chapters 18 and 19. And after that, what we call the perfection which is the resurrection and the post-resurrection appearances. So we're working our way through it. It's been a couple years. It's been a great study, but really the most exciting stuff is coming up. Now, tucked into that private ministry section is what we call the upper room discourse. It's what we've been studying since chapter 13, right? This long section from 13 to 16, one long drawn out uh, series of teachings from the Lord to his disciples. And in this discourse, he's made all kinds of promises to the disciples and also served up a whole bunch of warnings as well. And in the minds of the disciples, throughout this whole thing, there's this one idea that's sort of been hanging in the air that's caused them all kinds of concern. It's this repeated promise that Jesus says, I have to go away. I'm leaving and returning to the Father. It's caused them anxiety. And again, let's put ourselves in the sandals of these guys. Think about it. For three years now, while Jesus was with them physically, they had this this master who was there to love them and to lead them. They had this rabbi to believe in. He had filled their lives with hope, but now he's saying, I have to go away. And that wasn't all. Then it got worse, right? Once I leave, he said, Powerful forces are going to come after you. They're going to throw you out of the synagogue. They're going to try to ruin your lives. This world is going to turn against you. And don't be surprised, even if some try to kill you. And they'll kill you and then claim that they're actually offering service to God. That's how dark and lost this world is. And the reason behind all of it, Jesus said, is because they hate me. They hate Jesus. And this is true for us today. Jesus says to disciples then and to now, they, hate, they will hate you because of your devotion to me. We should expect that. They'll hate you because you're not part of the world system. You won't follow them into sin. You won't be conformed to what the world wants you to be. And the bottom line, Jesus says this himself, these folks who will hate you, they do not know God. They might claim to know God. They might do things in God's name, but they do not know God. In fact, they belong to their true father, the devil. So now this whole group, Jesus and the 11, are headed towards the Mount of Olives, right? They're walking together, and they're headed toward this particular garden 
that's located at the base of the mountain. It's known as Gethsemane, which in Hebrew means oil press. It comes from two Hebrew words. The, the Hebrew word for press is gat, and, and oil is shemen. And you put those two together, it's gat shemenim. And then it gets transliterated in English as this weird, strange, strange word, Gethsemane. And as you might guess, it's named that because there was, at Jesus' day, this very dense grove of olive trees that, that grew in that place, and there are still olive trees growing in that spot today. In fact, those of us are going to Israel together in November. We're going to get a chance to sit among those trees. Some of them are 900 years old. And to sit among those trees and to contemplate the agony that Christ experienced there. So the group's heading towards this garden where we know Jesus is going to be arrested. But first, he has some final comfort to offer to his friends. And it's not going to be on the screen, but I'm going to tell you verbally, there are three great realities Three great realities that Jesus is about to leave with his guys. Number one, you have a father who loves you. Number two, in me, you will have transcending peace. And number three, Jesus has overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. We'll come back to that later. For now, let's look at verse 25. Let's read our passage, verses 25 to 33. These things, Jesus said, I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father." His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. And Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Beautiful, beautiful words that so often we, we sort of like to kind of pull these out and, and, and read them isolated from the, the context, but so beautiful. Now, last Sunday, oh, how about a hand for Casey Phillips? Love you, Case. <laughs> All right, there it is. Good. Okay. So last Sunday, we talked about the concept of telescoping, right? How the Bible sometimes describes a condition or an event, right? And then there, there is this present-day reality and this present-day promise, but then it has multiple layers of fulfillment that will come in the future. So some fulfillment in the near future, some in the far-off future, and then some promises that are going to be fulfilled eschatologically, meaning in the very end of days. And last Sunday, we saw this in Jesus' use of this phrase, in a little while. Remember? In a little while, he said, you will no longer see me. And then in a little while, you will see me. And you're like, wait, what? But during that first little while, he promised that there would be this period of grief and sorrow. And remember, he compared it to a woman going through labor pains. There's this time of grief and sorrow and pain and tribulation and hardship. But at the end of that is what? Inexpressible joy inexpressible joy. And we telescope that principle then into our day. We said, look, for a little while, you and I have to live in this world, this world of trouble and sorrow. And while we're down here, we can't physically see Jesus. And so it's troublesome for us. But soon, in a little while, we're going to see him. When this vapor of this earthly life ends and we enter into eternity, we will see him, right? So we have to go through labor pains right now in our walk on the earth. But someday, there's this inexpressible joy. And Paul says, the, the, the pain that we go through now is not worthy of being compared to the glory that will someday be revealed to us. So we telescope that. Now, today we have a chance to look a little deeper at these 11 disciples and once again to look at their spiritual condition and see something of ourselves in them because we're, we're disciples as well, correct? And we're going to see that this group of men, their understanding is not great. And their faith is not as firm as it should be. 
And we should be able to connect with that because I think it's safe to say that this morning as we sit here, there's not one person in this room who feels like their spiritual condition is where they'd like it to be, right? It shouldn't be, right? We're not content with that because all of our life on this earth is this slow and steady process of being conformed to the image of Christ and not one of us has gotten there yet. So there's lots of room for us to grow just like these 11 guys, lots of room to grow, lots of room to be to be strengthened in our faith. And yet here's the good news for them and for us. We're going to see this in today's text. We'll see it in, in the next chapter in particular. In spite of their less than optimal, optimal spiritual walk with Christ, they are still loved. They're still uniquely set apart by God, greatly loved by both the Father and the Son. And that's good news for us, right? So wherever you're at this morning, and again, you're probably not content with where you should be, guess what? You're greatly loved and you're set apart for God's use. Now, before we get to the meat of the passage, let's look back at verse 25. I want to look at this phrase, figurative language. Jesus says, these things I've spoken to you in figurative language. It's actually just one word, a noun in the Greek. And what it refers to is, is, is language that is out of the ordinary. It's language that is symbolic or metaphorical. And because of that, it's language that is somewhat veiled in its meaning. So Jesus acknowledges here, yeah, I've been speaking to you in somewhat veiled terms. The second big question is, what does he mean by these things? What are these things that Jesus has spoken about in veiled language? And I think there's a whole number of possibilities here. In the short term, he's probably referring back to what he just said about this idea of a time of grief and sorrow and then inexpressible joy, and, and about the whole word picture that he gave about the woman in labor pains. He's saying, look, that's somewhat veiled language, but you'll understand someday. It's possible that here he's referring to the whole discourse that took place in the upper room, right? And the cryptic language he used when he said, hey, I've got to go back to the Father. Because listen, they didn't understand what that meant. Could they have possibly foreseen a cross and a resurrection? No. So it's sort of veiled language. And it's possible, some scholars believe that when he says these things, he's just talking about the whole three years of teaching. <laughs> because this has been his pattern throughout, right? He's used sort of, you know, figurative language. When he says, I'm the light of the world, can you picture the disciples going, okay. Or I'm the bread of life. Sure. Right? Figurative language, right? When he talked about the, the temple and his body, when he talked about eating his, his flesh and drinking his blood, when he said, before Abraham was born, I am. All of these things would have been puzzling to the disciples because the language is somewhat veiled. That's been his pattern all along, right? Using figurative language so that the disciples don't fully understand in the moment, but later they will. And that's the great promise. There's coming a time when they will. When Jesus goes away and the Spirit comes, they will finally begin to see these things and understand. Remember, Jesus himself said this back in chapter 13 in the upper room. Remember, he washed the disciples' feet and Peter protested. And what did Jesus say to him? He said, look, you're not going to realize what's going on now, but you will later. Even the washing of the feet was figurative in, in, in nature. You will get it someday, Peter. And he did. Now, you may wonder, and, and this is a question that people have asked for thousands of years, so we're not going to solve it uh, this morning. Why would the Lord operate this way? Why would he do this? Why speak in figurative language and just sort of leave his friends, his best friends, his closest friends, sort of grasping for the truth? See, if it was up to us, and, and we love to do this, we love to say, well, if I was God, that's a bad thing to do, by the way, uh, because you're not and you never will be, and you can't understand. But we'd say we'd make it really, really clear and just remove all of that confusion. But our ways are not God's ways, and we need to be content that God has a purpose in this. God doesn't do anything randomly. He doesn't do anything by accident or he doesn't waste things. He does everything with a purpose in mind. So what's the answer? I can't be, for sure, can't be sure. John Calvin wrote about this, interestingly. And here's what he said. He believed that the Lord allows his followers, here's the quote, to be stupefied for a time. <laughs> That's not exactly the most PC word. But to be stupefied for a time so that we're forced, he said, to see our own spiritual poverty before God sovereignly comes in and gives us clarity. And he said, if it were easy, we'd take credit for it. We'd take credit for our own brilliance rather than having to humbly seek the Lord for understanding. And eventually, because when that time comes, and maybe you've had these moments in your walk with Christ where light bulbs go off in your head or in your heart, and you're like, oh, 
I get it. When those things happen, then what do we do? We don't praise ourselves. We praise the Lord who brought that clarity to us. So I think Calvin's on to something there, but this much I know for sure. The Lord, always, for, the Lord knows us each completely, individually. He knows how much we can absorb and at what pace. And so as a patient father, he is, by the Spirit, illuminating things, revealing things to us in gradual amounts so that we can learn and grow at a pace according to his sovereign grace. And aren't you glad? We should all be glad for that. Now, here in verse 25, he promises, look, there is a time coming when I'll speak very plainly, and you'll fully understand. He said, an hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly about the Father. Again, I think there's multiple possibilities for what he means by an hour is coming. You see in this, in this last bit of this chapter 16, all of these references to time frames, in a little while, an hour is coming. Right? And it leaves open, well, what is this time frame? We know that after the resurrection, Jesus is going to spend 40 days on the earth in a glorified state. And he's going to tell his followers about himself and about the Father's plan. So we could be talking about that. Second, we know there's this all-important time coming when the Spirit will fall. and He will indwell the disciples and he will lead them into all truth. So there's probably multiple fulfillments of this as well. There's coming a day when I will speak plainly. When I'm on the earth after I've come back from the, the grave, when the Spirit comes, and if you really want to project or telescope into the future, someday we're going to write all this down. And, and the Spirit is going to carry certain men along to write God's literal word so that it plainly describes, it cuts through all the figurative language and the darkness and presents very plainly the truth of the gospel. So it's possible he has all of those things in mind. But there's a time coming when you'll understand. That's his promise. What else will happen in that day? Verse 26, in that day you will ask in my name. Now he's just said that recently, right? That's a repeat. But then he adds this interesting phrase, and it's a little awkward in the New American Standard. It says, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. Wow. Wow. All right, so this takes us back to that moment where Jesus says to the disciples who don't understand again, he says, look, it's to your advantage that I go away. And they're like, how can that possibly be? This is another benefit of him going away. In prayer, we have direct access to God the Father. With the coming of the new covenant and this intercessory work that Jesus will soon accomplish on the cross, we learn something about the Father, right? He's not some cold, distant deity who stands apart from his children. We don't have to, this is really the intent of it. We don't have to work our way up a chain of command to get our prayer request to God the Father. That's what he's saying here. And by the way, this would have been very stunning for anybody who was Jewish in this day. If you were a first century Jew, you viewed God as distant and veiled, there was no intimacy involved here. Nobody, no Jew in the first century talked about God as my father. They certainly would never call him Abba. Even the high priest of Israel, he gets one day, essentially, where he gets to be, have an intimacy with, with God, with Yahweh in the Holy of Holies. Even he doesn't have everyday access, intimate access to God. But everything's about to change. Now through Christ, our mediator, things are about to change. Up until now, he, Jesus says, whatever you needed, you just came to me and asked. And that's been great. But once I go away and the Spirit comes to you, you are going to be able to go to the throne of grace and ask the Father directly. Wow. And of course, that picture then gets illustrated for us, right? At the point that Christ dies on the cross, what happens to the veil in the temple? It's torn. It's torn in two, and the Holy of Holies is exposed. Can you imagine that moment? It becomes open. It becomes accessible, which is a picture of what Jesus is promising here. Listen to Hebrews 10. Boom. Therefore, right? This is explained many years later, right, in Hebrews. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness, underline that word boldness, boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, Listen, what Jesus just said does not negate the fact that he is our intercessor. We only come to the Father through him, right? Through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that veil, which really is, he says, that is through his flesh. What a word picture. 
And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. So once the Holy of Holies was exposed by Jesus' sacrificial death, we as disciples can now come boldly into Yahweh's presence. Boldly. And we can say, Father, I'm here because Jesus said I can be here. I've come through him, but he said I can come to you directly, to your throne of grace. I love the way Calvin writes this. I love this phrase. He says, we have the heart of the heavenly Father as soon as we have placed before him the name of his Son. Direct access to the Father. Guys, what a privilege. A first century Jew would look at us and go, you are so privileged to be able to do that. We don't, they went through a priesthood, didn't they? We have direct access, access to the Father. Never take that for granted. All right, let's move on to verses 29 and 30. This is where we begin to see the weakness of the disciples' faith. Verse 29, his disciples said, and this word low is very strange in the English. It basically is ah. Say it, ah. Ah. Now, they say, you're speaking plainly. Thank you, Jesus. You're not using a figure of speech. Verse 30, now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this, we believe that you came from God. Now, okay, there's all kinds of scholarly, actually, there's two, two types of scholarly opinions on what's going on here. The first one says, okay, the disciples just got some brand new sort of uh, uh, insight into what Jesus has been saying in that moment, right? And they're sincerely expressing what they now believe and affirm. Others insist that they're the opposite is happening here. They're actually covering for their lack of understanding, right? That, that what they're trying to do is give Jesus the impression that they understand what he says, but they really don't. Remember back in, I think it was verse 18, they, Jesus said something, they started whispering to each other because they were sort of embarrassed. Like, Let, let's talk this, about this amongst ourselves so he doesn't know that we're struggling, right? I think that's what's happening here. They're embarrassed at their ignorance. They just want him to think that they understand so that he's not disappointed in them. And he's done this before. He sort of rebuked them for being slow to understand. I think this is the correct theory. Jesus had just promised, hey, an hour is coming when I will speak plainly. Well, that hasn't happened yet. And there's nothing in the text that gives us the indication that they got some sudden bolt of lightning of understanding. So they give him what they think he wants to hear. They're like, yeah, Jesus, we get it now. It, it's actually kind of humorous. And again, put yourself in their sandals. Like, okay, Lord, we get it now. We're fine. We're good. But are they? And listen, as a, as a pastor, I've always, found, I've always found this truth about the Gospels very comforting and encouraging. Remember, this group of men is going to be the apostolic team, if you want to put it that way, who is going to go on and change the world, right? The apostolic team through whom Christ is going to establish and build his church and write the New Testament. And yet they're not all that special. That's important to know. Imagine a different scenario where Jesus had gathered all the great Hebrew scholars of the day to be his disciples, right? Super learned men with all the religious garments and all this stuff. But he didn't. These guys are not all that strong. They're not scholarly. They're not gifted. And here we see they're even a bit awkward. But the encouragement is God has always used ordinary people like us, to do extraordinary things for the kingdom. That's the way he works, so that he gets the glory, right? So he works through ordinary people. And, and to that, we should all say amen. This is very encouraging. That means there's nobody here this morning who God can't work through. You're like, ah, I'm too ordinary. Welcome to the club. God's working through us, right? This is, in fact, this is Paul's testimony of the early church in 1 Corinthians 1. This is us, folks, Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective. We're not all that smart. Not many were powerful, right? We came from, you know, lower class, middle class, whatever it is. We're not powerful. Not many of noble birth, right? We weren't born into some, you know, high and exalted status. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. Who wants to be a fool for the Lord? Amen. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong, right? The ones who say they're strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something. Through Christ, the world is turned upside down. 
That's, when you wonder, why do we see everything so differently than, than people who don't know Christ? It's, it's, compl- it's polar opposite, isn't it? We have a different worldview. And there's the, at the end the key phrase, so that no one may boast in his presence. The late British theologian Charles Dodd put, this, put it really nicely. Here's what he said. He said, it's part of the character and genius of the church that its founding members were discredited men. Therefore, it owed its existence not to their faith or courage or virtue, but to what Christ had done with them. And this they could never forget because they knew it. They knew they weren't all that special, that it was God that was working through them. Man, that's great news for us. Welcome, ordinary disciples. So they pretend that they get it here. And then in verse 31, Jesus challenges that. He says, oh, do you now believe? And I think there's a hint of sarcasm. I, I wish there were like a, little, uh, like a little vowel point or something they could put anytime we see sarcasm in the Bible so we'd know it, right? It'd be a little nice little vowel point that says, this is sarcasm. But we can only sort of look at it. But I think there's, he's like, oh, oh, you get it now, do you? Right? You've got this figured out? Like, that did, did that just suddenly happen? And then he goes on to say, I'm about to drop a bomb on you guys. Here it comes. He predicts their coming failure in verse 32. So you get it, do you? Well, behold, an hour is coming and has already come. It's in the works right at that moment for you to be scattered each to his own home and to leave me alone. So now we're within this hour that Jesus is going to be arrested. We are right on the brink of all the fear and the panic and the running. This is about to happen. Remember earlier in the evening, Jesus has said to Peter directly, bro, you think you're strong? You think you'll lay down your life for me? You're about to deny even knowing me three times. And I don't know how the, how the other disciples felt like, oh, well, that's just Peter. Well, now he says, you're all going to falter, all of you, not just Peter. You are going to run. Out of self-preservation, you are going to run, and you're going to leave me alone, exposed. But he says, I'm not exposed. The Father's with me, right? Matthew and Mark, in their recounting of this moment, say that Jesus actually quoted from Zechariah 13, 7, strike the shepherd and the sheep are scattered. The disciples' faith is about to be shaken and tested as never before. And the master wants them to know. This is why he said this. He wants them to know in advance so that when their spiritual failure takes place, that's not going to be the last word on their journey. He wants them to know, yes, they are going to lose the spiritual battle on this night, but they're not going to lose the larger spiritual war because Christ is with them. And that's what matters most. So he's saying, look, guys, the reason I'm telling you these things is not so that you'll understand all of it right now in this moment, But at some point in the future, you will understand and you'll see that everything I told you was going to happen has happened. And then you will know that all things are under my sovereign control and you will know that I am who you believe me to be, that I am the Christ. And so this is part of the point this morning. These disciples did believe. They did have a measure of faith, just like us. Even though if you looked at it, you could say, well, there's some holes, right, in the strength of their faith. There's some holes in their understanding. Welcome to the club. All of us are like that. But look what Jesus says in verse 27, beginning at 27, he affirms two great facts about the simple faith of these men. A, you have loved me. And B, you have believed that I came forth from the Father, which means you believe that I am God. Simple faith. Jesus knows these men are true believers. All they need now is time and trials. That's what they need. Time to learn, time to understand. And yes, they, we talked about it last Sunday. They need trials and suffering to stretch their faith, to test their faith. And that first test is about to come. Here's the thing. It is so easy to believe. This, this is true of all of us. So easy to believe in Jesus when things are going well. When you're sitting in the upper room in the presence of the Lord, you're basking in his goodness and his love and you feel all secure, that's one thing. It's a whole nother thing to believe in Jesus in a moment of crisis when soldiers are running towards you and they might arrest you and kill you. And so the disciples are gonna stumble in this moment as we do on occasion. But when these traumatic days pass, in a little while, Jesus promised, 
and everything comes true that Jesus had predicted, well, then their faith is going to come out on the other side greatly strengthened. That's what we need as well. So here's the lesson. Men fail, God does not. Men are going to fail, but God never fails. Paul wrote this to Timothy. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. And that's good news, right? Still true today in disciples like us. Our faith falters. There are times, guys, we run when we should stand. We run, just like the disciples. We see soldiers coming and we run. And we don't stand firm. But God never fails us. We fall short of our understanding, but God never fails us. So we stumble. And when we stumble, what do we do? Do we sit there having a pity party? No, we get back up and we confess our sin and we repent. And God strengthens us and grows us through that. And guess what? Over time and over maturity, we don't repeat those mistakes. This is the Christian life. This is who we are. Now, here's my favorite part of the passage. In spite of their weakness, look at, look at verse 27 again. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me. No, no, I, I can't be. I'm so weak in my faith. I lack so much understanding. No, the Father himself loves you, Jesus says. Can you imagine what that would have sounded and felt like to these men in this moment? The Father, Yahweh, he himself loves you because you've loved me. Have you ever stopped long enough to ask the question about, about God's sovereignty in your life? We, we talk a lot about that at Oak Hill. How is it possible that God chose me and marked me out for salvation? Of all the people on the earth, why why does he look upon me and call me his own? It's a good question to ask. What a privilege. But as simple as it sounds, it comes down to this statement, God has sovereignly loved you. God has sovereignly loved you, warts and all, failures and weaknesses. He has marked you out and loved you with a saving love. If you, if you love Jesus, if you have made Jesus both Lord and Savior of your life, if you are following Christ this morning and you trust in him alone and nothing else, the Father loves you. Get that through your head and your heart. If you love Jesus, the Father loves you. And it's a family love. It's a, it's a, it's a love with deep affection. And it's in the present tense here. He continually loves you. Continually. It's infinite love. It's eternal love. It's it's unchanging love. And maybe that's the best news of all. It's unchanging. You can't do anything to nullify it. He just loves you. Accept it. And, best news of all, he loves you even though he knows everything about you. Maybe that's the hardest thing for us. In our, in our human bodies and minds and hearts, we think about conditional love, right? Well, God can't possibly do that because look at me. Look at me. See, you can get people, in, in human terms, you can get people to love you if you just show them the best parts of you and you hide the ugly stuff, right? But as people get to know the whole you, it becomes harder to love you. Same, same is true of me. That's not true of God. He knows you and loves you. So that critical spirit that you struggle with, he knows about it, right? The bitterness that you are, are wrestling with, or that lust in your heart for this or that. He knows it. When you're holding on to hate in your heart towards somebody else, or you're judging people or seeking revenge, he knows. He knows all of it. And he still chose you to be his child. He still wants you in his family. This is hard for us, right? But never in those moments where you're struggling with your faith, in those moments where you are wrestling with assurance, and you were wishing that you were further along in your walk, hold on to the beauty of this truth, and it will get you through. John 16, 27, the Father himself loves you because you have loved his Son. Amen? Now, in just a moment, Jesus is going to start to pray for his disciples. All of chapter 17, and this is next Sunday, he's going to pray for his disciples. But what he's about to say in this last verse, verse 33, Final words matter, don't they? The final words that we speak matter. The final promises he, he gives to them are here in verse 33. So look carefully at it. Man, I, I, again, I, I wish I had more 
color to sort of fill this out. But I picture in my mind Jesus pausing and looking at these guys. He knows what's about to happen. And he pauses and he looks at them. He says, guys, these things I have spoken to you so that you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation. But take courage, I've overcome the world. And then he begins to pray for them. So we've been pointing a lot to this truth in recent weeks, right? This idea of tribulation. But here it is plain as day. In this world, you will have tribulation. So Christian, don't be surprised at this, right? Know that you're going to have trouble and affliction and trials and suffering and grief and sorrow. Jesus does not speak of it as a possibility. He speaks of it as a brute fact of life for the believer. You will have tribulation. And especially for these men, what they're about to go through. And catch this. In the midst of this tribulation, though, what does he talk about? Having peace. And and in our minds, we're like, wait, those two things don't go together. When things are good, we have peace. And he says, no, in the midst of tribulation, you have peace. So we got to wrap our minds around this, right? He says that these two things coexist. Peace coexists with tribulation. Peace coexists with sorrow. The peace that Jesus gives is a peace that can be apprehended even in the worst circumstances of life. Even if you're facing death, you can have peace. That's what he's saying here. How is that possible? Well, it's a peace the world can't give. So if you're thinking about an earthly definition of peace, it's not that. It's not the type of peace that you can muster up in your, in your own mind to like make yourself feel better about things. This is a description of a divine peace, a supernatural peace that only Christ can give. It's a peace that surpasses all human comprehension, Paul says. You can't even comprehend it. And that's the promise that Jesus is giving his friends here. Look, the world is coming for you. And it's going to be rough, but in the midst of that storm, you have peace peace Christian you have peace and so because of that here's so so that's something that only Christ can give right this peace we we can't earn that we can't go out and get it he says he'll give you peace but here's our action step you ready knowing that Jesus says what take courage that is the imperative here that is the command take courage that's your action step Because you know that what Jesus said is true, take courage, Christian. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, in the Greek, again, it's just a single verb, tharseo, and its meaning has really two primary ideas. The first one is what we usually think of in terms of English, in terms of courage. It's the idea of, you know, we think about a soldier going into battle and he's facing an unknown future. He may not come back alive, and so he has courage to step into that battle. And there's truth to that. As Christians, we walk every day into a spiritual battle, and we don't know what we're going to face. It's going to be hard, right? There's that part of it. But the second meaning of this verb is to be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. So Jesus is saying here, look, be of good cheer, stay joyful and optimistic, stand firm, face the future with strength, because I have won the victory for you. That's the command here. That is the command. Every time this command, by the way, is used in the New Testament, it's Jesus who speaks it. I'll I'll give you three examples right here, really quick. Matthew 9, 2. He tells that paralytic, right, whom he healed. He says, take courage, son. Your sons are forgiven. Same same, uh, Same chapter, chapter 9 of Matthew. He tells the suffering woman with the bleeding problem who touches the hem of his garment. He says, daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. In Matthew 14, 27, he tells the frightened disciples who see him walking on the water, take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. So you can see how how what Jesus offers in these three verses, forgiveness of sins, physical healing, and his presence, right, should bring about both courage and gladness because Christ is at work. He's given you these things. Be of good cheer, but also take courage now. Take courage because I've given you this thing. I've overcome the world, he says. I've conquered everything for you. I've conquered the world system. I've conquered sin. I've conquered Satan. I have conquered death itself. He can say that even before the cross because it's a fact. He's overcome all these things. 
And if we're found in Jesus, his victory is our victory. His victory is our victory. That makes us both courageous and glad. That, that should be the, the disposition of your heart each and every day. And if it isn't, it's time to sort of renew your thinking. We walk out that front door in the morning glad and courageous because of who Christ is, because of what he's done, because he's won the victory for you. It doesn't matter, honestly, what the world throws at you. I'm not saying it's easy, but the victory is ours in him. So here are these guys, like us, weak in faith, struggling to understand, and it's Friday. And, and they're confused, and they're scared. And at this point, they can't see through the darkness, right? They can't see what's coming on Sunday. But Sunday's going to come, right? And with it is the resurrection and hope and peace and inexpressible joy. For a little while, is going to be really hard. But Sunday will come. And so three great realities that we talked about earlier for you. If you're sitting here this morning, friends, and you're like, man, my, my faith is so weak. And I, I just, I don't understand what I should understand. I, I feel like I, I should be further along with the Lord. I'm, I'm struggling with fear. I'm struggling with assurance. So if it feels like Friday right now for you and it feels dark right now, look to the scriptures and see these truths. I'll put them back up. You have a father who loves you. Never forget that. In Christ, you have transcending peace. Peace that surpasses anything the world can throw at you. And Jesus has ultimately overcome the world. His victory over sin and death is your victory over sin and death. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father, it is so good to, to hear in your word both sides of this this coin that we see here that you have warned us that in this world we will have tribulation and yet you've said you have my peace. And so we can walk through this life with that sense of gladness and courage. We don't have to be tossed to and fro by the waves of circumstance and the pressures that society throws upon us. We can be confident in you and confident that we know where we're headed, that there's there's victory at the end of all of this. And so, Jesus, we thank you that you were, you were willing to go to that cross and that you shared with your disciples and with us all the truth that is connected to that with your resurrection and to know that sin and death have been overcome. And, and so, Lord, I, I pray for myself and my brothers and sisters, even this week, that you would lift our hearts so that we might lift our eyes and see you afresh and and just have cur courage and gladness in you. Thank you for the victory, Father. Thank you that even now we're, we're at your throne of grace, that we have access to you and that you love us so much. Help us to bask in that family love this morning, even as we sing now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.